I, I would like to say something here and answer that question, and it deals with the other one at the same time. If we have to get perfect before revival comes, we don't need revival. That, that's one of the things I think that's very important. And if you think that you've got all your ducks in the row so revival can now come, I can assure you revival will never come. Also, there has never been, nor will there ever be, a great man of God. There has only been weak, sinful, broken, frail, unbelieving men of a great and a merciful God. I would like to appeal to Calvary Road. I, I have, in my life, over 25 years, I have, I, I'm not lying to say that I have seen a bit of victory. I have seen changes in my life in conformity to Christ. But even as I sit here right now, the only thing I can claim to be is a recipient of grace. I have seen God do many, many things, and after He has done them, it has almost put me in a fetal position back in the hotel room where I've cried out, Lord, depart from me, I am a sinful man. Almost as though, Lord, you should not have allowed that work to have gone on through me. And I think one thing we have to be very careful here is Getting all your ducks in the row in order to bring revival is almost, it, it just almost contradicts itself. I know the pastor kept saying, and I noticed something very interesting. More, the older men speak more of this than the younger men. Brokenness. 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 The, the, most, the most comforting thing to me as a weak, frail man, and that is the grace of of repentance, the fact that a broken heart God will not despise. And I think the one thing that keeps occurring in this is humility, brokenness, and trusting that the Lord is the God He says He is. The most difficult thing you're ever going to have to do as a Christian is to look in the mirror of God's Word and see all your moral flaws and then believe that He loves you as much as God says He does. And, and this is something that I, I want you to... The, I wish sometimes that you could come home with me, especially you young men, that you could come home with me for a week. Most of you would be so disappointed. I hope that you would not see a hypocrite. I hope that you would not see a man who pretends to be one thing in front of men and another with his family. But what you would see is just a needy person of grace. And so don't be looking so much at all these things that we're going to get right and God's going to come, but just look at the, the absolute helplessness. One other thing is this, and I learned this from Charles Leiter many years ago as I was praying, and then uh, Bill McLeod, when I met him a year or a half ago, two years ago, I saw the same thing in his life, and it's this. I heard a preacher say one time that the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost as those men were agonizing in the upper room. I'm not so sure they were agonizing. Why did they need to agonize? Christ had promised them the Holy Spirit. Could it be they were joyfully waiting on a promise that they knew their master would bring because it had little to do with their personal piety to, and everything to do with his faithfulness? Brokenness does not mean that we, we fall into some form of, of self-mutilation in order to bring about the work of God's Spirit. God has given us great and mighty promises if we would just joyfully pull ourselves away from the world and joyfully wait upon Him, trusting not in the fact that we got all our ducks in a row, but trusting in the fact He is a merciful God and He does not despise the brokenhearted. If it was not for grace, my best day would put me in hell. The best moment of my best day. If the power of God in preaching depended upon piety, I would never be able to mutter a word in a pulpit. It is all of grace, as Spurgeon said. All of grace.